the poor troop is learning what you guys have to deal with every Sunday, which is, oh, by the way, let's try this. <laughs> and so what it is I have asked him, it really will tie into my message. But as we celebrate Scout Sunday, I've asked if they will be able to do Scout Oath and Scout Law for us this morning. Stay right there for a second. Because what I'm going to do is ask if anybody here, yes, those of you who are dressed appropriately, and any of you who was a scout at any one time in your life, either Boy Scout or Girl Scout, would you stand up this morning? I had a sense that a number of you would be. Now you may sit, and so may you. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for that, and thank you for being here with us this morning, and thank you for all that you guys do, and special thanks to all the adults who make sure that the troop exists, does well, and contributes to our community. So what you guys just shared there, would you consider those sort of rules, sort of a code that you guys strive to live by? to live up to. Do you get it right every single time? <laughs> I was going to say, I probably should not have asked that with the scout. Yeah, answer with your eyes and not with the shaking of your head. <laughs> if you fall short on any of those things, are you automatically kicked out of the troop? Are you encouraged by your leaders and your fellow scouts just to do better the next time? Because it's an ethic, it's something to live into, to strive for. The scripture passage that you heard read very nicely had a lot of pieces and I could go on for hours. It's the beauty of the narrative lectionary. It gives me such a long passage. I could keep you captive <laughs> for hours on end. But I'd be the only one standing here and the rest of you would be downstairs eating donuts. So I won't. But within that passage, you may have heard something that's often referred to as the golden rule. Very simply stated, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Pretty much our sort of code of ethics, if you will. Now I had, a, I had the uh, military code of conduct, 25 years in the army. That was ingrained and emblazed in my mind. I'm not going to recite every piece of it to you. There's a lot. You had some of you stood up as scouts, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Cub Scouts, Brownies. Some of you have played on sports teams. Some of you sing in choirs or choral groups, theatrical groups. Some of you are involved in fraternal organizations. The list goes on and on, and I would imagine that every group that you participate in, there are expectations of how you are part of that group, how you live within that group, that community. Whether they are written down or whether they are simply just passed down, there's expectations. I would love to say that as soon as Jesus shared these words with those that were gathered around and said, hey, all of this stuff really boils down to just treat people really, really well. Treat people the exact same way you want to be treated. No exceptions. That whole part at the beginning about, you know, why are you picking on somebody else and finding fault with them knowing that we've got our own issues and our own faults? our own shortcomings, even as we're striving to do better, as Jesus starts off what we had this morning with, you know what, stop picking on other people, sort of work on your own stuff. 
I would love to say that as soon as Jesus said that with that early crowd, everybody got it, to include the early disciples and the early church as it began, and things have been perfect ever since. That's what I thought, too. But it doesn't mean, much like I asked you guys, that we don't take that lesson, that we don't continue to do better. I would love to say that the church historic has gotten it right from the beginning. There are too many examples within the Christian setting regardless of what denomination or tradition it might be, that for some reason we seem to gravitate looking for specks in people's eyes rather than that part where Jesus simply says, would you just love one another as you want to be loved? That's my paraphrase for do unto others. Would you simply love people the way you want to be loved? Will you accept others the way you want to be accepted. I believe the crux of our faith is as simple as that. And yet, our scripture passage goes on to say there's a wide path and a narrow path. Too often, I think, we think that when they're talking about a wide path and a narrow path, we think that that just means there's only so many of us that can get it. There's only so many of us that are going to be welcomed in. I don't believe that's the correct interpretation, even though oftentimes we find ourselves living into that understanding. I think perhaps the narrow path, the difficult path, is going back to do unto others. Love as you want to be loved. Because for as easy as it sounds, I personally have found it to be incredibly difficult to do. It's a very narrow path. But even as, for as narrow as it is, I think there's room for every single one of us to be able to travel on. The church historic, and so church, for those of you who call this church home, I'm not saying us as a church. I'm saying the church historic from its inception has struggled with the whole concept of who's in and who's out. Whose specs we should be focusing in on. Who should we love and who should we not. The church historic has continued to struggle. There are times in our past that we didn't allow folks that were of different color to be in our midst. Or there were times within our history that the genders, male and female, were not seen as equal. There were times that different economic classes weren't necessarily comfortable with one another. I could continue down the list of those things that where we continue to separate, push aside, look for specs because we don't understand or we don't agree or we don't relate to. And yet, I think the crux of the message in the passage and in the gospel overall boils down to do unto others as you would have done unto you. Love others as you want to be loved. Could you imagine? No, I'm not going to start singing John Lennon, although it's rising up in me right now. But could you imagine a world that that actually truly happened? That we stopped looking for the shortcomings in other people. 
We recognize that we had our own but didn't stop and dwell there. But that we simply invited everyone that we met along for a journey together on that path. What would it look like for communities, worshiping communities, or just our community out there in general, our schools, our places of employment, whatever it might be? What might it look like if that revolutionary gospel message of that golden rule was taken to heart and lived out? Church, I have some invitations for you. And scouts and scout families and scout leaders, since you are here this morning, by extension, you are family. So therefore, you are invited, whether you have another place that you call your faith community and worship or none at all. This past Wednesday, a couple of local pastors and I invited the faith leader of the new Sikh. Did, did any of you familiar that we have a new faith community here in Twinsburg? Are any of you familiar with the religion called Sikhism? That's S-I-K-H-I-S-M. There is a Sikh faith community of Greater Cleveland that now is in, I can't remember the name of the church that it was once, once was, in front of Pinewood Gardens. But it, I'm imagining most of you have met Sikh neighbors or have seen folks in our community. We met with him and discussed things that we have in common and ways to work together. He got so excited that he said, how about on March 10th at one o'clock, any of the members of your community that want to come and learn a little bit more about what we do and what we believe, come join us. We'll share a few minutes about what it is that makes us us. You're welcome to come in and see how we worship. And then, here's, here's where he got me. And then at the end of that, come back over and we'll have food. <laughs> and ask questions. And let us be neighbors. So there is an invitation for any of you on March 10th at 1 o'clock. If you want to experiment or to see something different and meet someone who's perhaps a little different. The end of this month, February 24th. This congregation here in this space, we're hosting a Black History Unity service. So in my creativity, it's C, capital C, small O M M, capital U, N I T Y. It's our community service at 7 o'clock, where we're going to celebrate Black History within our own community. But we've invited faith congregations who are historically black churches, whether it be from the Heights or elsewhere, to join us. I now have seven churches on board. And that Sikh community that I just talked about. Perhaps the Jewish congregation that meets in our community. And my hope and desire is on the 24th and on the 10th, we don't start walking around looking for specs. We don't start looking for things that we think are shortcomings of the other. But instead, we move further into the passage and we do unto them as we want done unto us. That we love them as we want to be loved. Perhaps that's the genesis of our meal exploration team that's going to meet after church today. As we welcome folks in, not trying to see what may be wrong in their lives, but simply because we're entering, inviting them to come in, to be welcomed and loved and fed. Perhaps, no matter what ministry we decide to do here, church, that becomes the genesis or the beginning, the foundation, our law, our code of ethics, to boil it down. To love our neighbors 
as ourselves. There's so much that this world needs. There's so much that this community needs. Perhaps we've never lived in a time that is more divisive than now. I've lived for a long time. I've seen a lot of conflict and combat. But I'm not sure I've seen our communities as divided as they seem to be right now. Church, can we be the place to build community, not only with one another, but with the neighbors around us? An invitation for you all, whether you call this church home or not.